Our title today is How to Be Single from the passage that was just read. Let's pray. Father, your word is powerful. We're told that it is sharper than a two-edged sword. That it pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow. That it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. And Father, as we read that description, we recognize that that is not comfortable. And so I pray, Father, that you would not allow us to be comfortable as your word is taught. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would take your word and apply it to our lives and make us squirm a little bit. I pray, Father, that I would be your tool and your instrument to effectively communicate the truth of your word to the people that you have brought here today. May Christ be glorified. May saints be equipped. In Jesus' name, amen. Calling, mission, fellowship. Every single believer has these three experiences. Everyone who has been saved by faith in Jesus Christ has a calling from God. When we are redeemed by the blood of Christ, we have a mission. As blood-bought children of the Most High, we are able to fellowship with Him. Today, we have a topic before us about which most believers have an intellectual agreement. What I mean is that most of us know what Scripture teaches on this topic. However, it is also a topic that, practically speaking, our practical application of what Scripture teaches is often severely lacking. Our topic today is singleness. While we were gone, Daryl spoke from 1 Corinthians 8, and that was where I had planned to be in 1 Corinthians. However, uh, we had a, a section that needed more time to develop, and so Daryl jumped ahead to chapter 8. We're going back to chapter 7. We did that because, as we noted, when we started chapter 7, Paul uh, begins here to answer questions from the Corinthian church. And every time he answers a question, we see the phrase, now concerning. Okay, So chapter 8 is a new section, so that was okay to deal with it by itself. It's going to be chapters 8 through 11. And then here, we're still finishing up the topic of marriage. Okay, So chapter 7 is this proper understanding of marriage. And in this chapter, Paul deals with marriage, he deals with divorce, he deals with the death of a spouse. And now in our passage today, he's going to deal with those who are single, who have never been married, and those who are engaged. Paul deals with this topics and he touches on what I mentioned at the beginning, our calling, our mission, and our fellowship. Every believer shares three responsibilities. And it is only as we are faithful to fulfill our responsibility that we will grow in our walk with Christ. To live out our calling, to fulfill our mission, and to rest in fellowship with Christ, these are our responsibilities. Responsibility number one, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Raise your hand if you absolutely love waiting. <clears throat> All right. I hate it. <laughs> on our trip, there were several times where we were thinking about going to a particular coffee shop or a restaurant, and we changed our minds because the line was long. Anybody else ever done that? We don't like waiting. We live in an instant society. If you walk down the grocery store aisle, you are going to be, uh, have the word instant jump out at you, right? Instant oatmeal, instant coffee, instant mashed potatoes, instant everything. What I have yet to see as I walk down the grocery store aisle is something that says instant maturity or instant sanctification. I have not found those products because they do not exist. Maturity and sanctification take time. 
And when it comes to singleness and marriage, we have to wait on the Lord. We have to trust His calling. We trust that all things happen according to His plan and purpose. Now, we're talking about singleness, but before any of you check out and go, well, I don't need to listen to that, the principles that Paul lays out here apply to all of us in our Christian life. And that is something that is key to understanding God's call for people who are single and God's call for people who are married is basically the same. Right? That's what we're going to see. It's just going to look a little bit different in its application. Okay? So in the Christian life, we practice what I call active waiting. Okay? There's two actions we take as we wait on the Lord. Action number one, we need to be observant. Be observant. Look at verses 25 and 26 of chapter 7. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord... Yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. This word now concerning, as we said, indicates Paul is responding to a specific question. What was the question? The question was about virgins, people who have never engaged in sexual activity. They've never been married. What do they do? And Paul says, I don't have a commandment from Christ. Christ didn't speak about this when he was on the earth, but he says, I am going to give you my judgment. This word judgment could also be translated opinion. Paul says, I'm going to give you my opinion. Now, he's not just giving his opinion as, uh, you know, just Joe Schmo off the sidewalk. He says he's giving his opinion as someone who has been considered trustworthy by God. He is a faithful minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He accurately handles the word of truth. And so his opinion is a biblically informed opinion. Okay? Paul's wording here is interesting. He says in this verse, I'm at the wrong spot. There we go. Um, I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. This word made is active. The Lord in his mass, merciful, in his boundless love and mercy, has made Paul trustworthy. Paul is faithful. Now, faithfulness is not a product of human will or determination. Faithfulness is a product of God's matchless grace and his boundless mercy. So Paul says, God has made me faithful. And as a faithful minister, Paul gives his opinion. And what is his opinion? In light of the present distress, he says, it's better to stay single. Now, Paul starts verse 26 with these words, I suppose. Suppose is the Greek word namizo, and it means to think, to consider, to believe, to suppose. To think or believe something without being fully settled in mind or opinion. This is an important word because Paul lets us know he is not issuing a binding command okay paul is not commanding people to stay single he's not commanding them to be married he's giving his opinion as a minister of jesus christ as he observes the times in which they live as he looks at scripture it's his opinion that believers will be better able to serve the lord without the entanglement of marriage that is what he's saying here it's not a command, it's not binding, it's simply the opinion of Paul. What is Paul doing? What he's doing is he's observing the world around him. And he says, times are getting tough. When Paul wrote this, it's about 10 years before persecution really ramps up under Nero, okay, in history. Paul's looking around. Do we know that Paul suffered? You guys remember that from Acts, right? Paul knows what it means to suffer. And he says, look, this world is not friendly to Christians. And so in light of the present distress, he says, it's better to stay as you are. What do we take from this? What Paul is saying is that the things he had been through would have been far more difficult to face if he had had a wife with him. It would have been so much harder to do what he needed to do had he had a wife with him. Now, we're going to learn in chapter 9 that some of the other apostles took their wives with them as they ministered. So he's not saying that it's impossible. What he's saying is, I'm looking at our world, and there's difficult things happening, and I think it's better if people were just single. Okay? 
What we need to do is we need to be students of our times. See, there is so often the attitude in the church that, well, if you're single, yeah, you can sort of serve the Lord, but especially if you've never been married, there's this idea that we just got to get you married and then you can really, really do something for God. Well, that's not true. God calls some people to singleness. He calls some people to marriage. We have to have discernment, and discernment comes from Scripture. And so we need to read and study Scripture. We need to learn about God through His Word. And we need to learn how we act in this culture that's moving away from God. And so our lesson from this is that effective service requires biblical discernment and cultural observation. That is what Paul is doing. Would you read that with me, please? Effective service requires biblical discernment and cultural observation. We can't engage a culture we don't understand. Paul understood the times in which we live. And we can't engage a culture accurately if we're not exercising biblical discernment. So we wait on the Lord, but we take two actions. First, we be observant. Secondly, be content. Be content. Look at verse 27. Verse 27, are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. Pretty straightforward. Because of the present distress, Paul says, stay how you are. God has you where you want. he wants you. Rest in him. If you're married, stay married. If you're not, stay single. That is Paul's advice. Reminder, if this is not a binding command, it's Paul's opinion. Now he clarifies this in verse 28. Look at verse 28. He says, but even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, and I would spare you. It is not sinful to marry. <laughs> we, we need to hear this. Paul knew they needed to hear this loud and clear. Why? Because some in the Corinthian church were saying it is more spiritual to be single. Is that a message that exists in our world? Yes, that's what the Catholic Church teaches. The really spiritual people, the priests and the nuns, don't get married. Paul's saying that's not true. Paul's saying if you, if you don't get married, you haven't, if you get married, you haven't sinned. It's not sinful. His point is that marriage should not be our all-consuming passion. I went to Bible school. You know what I found in Bible school? A lot of people who just really wanted to get married. Okay? Now, is that wrong of them? Not necessarily. But once you're married, you realize that there are limitations that you have that someone who is single does not have. That doesn't make marriage wrong. It makes it different. And it makes your service for Christ different. Marriage should not be our all-consuming passion. Service for Christ should be. And if God has called you to singleness at this time, be seeking ways to serve him. Some people... Now, all of us are called to singleness before we're married. Does that make sense? We're all, obviously, right? We're single. We're called to singleness, we get married. Some God will then call to singleness after marriage, through death or something like that, divorce. What we need to understand is that it's a calling from God and he will give all the grace and the strength and the mercy necessary to serve him in that capacity. Folks, I just want to let you know that we have a lot of incredible single people serving the Lord right here at Grace Church. They're doing it. So if you want to know, well, can, can single people serve the Lord? Go ask them, because they are, okay? The point is this, our desire to serve the Lord should be greater than our desire to be married, okay? It isn't sinful to marry. Why is Paul recommending against it? In, the, in the, his day, times were tough for Christians, and they were getting harder, much like today. And his conclusion was that service for Christ would be easier without the difficulties that marriage can bring. And that's why he says you will have trouble in the flesh. So, to be clear, marriage is an incredible institution designed by God for procreation, for pleasure, for growth, for sanctification, and for an illustration of Christ in the church. Marriage is awesome! However, would any of us who are married say that it is easy? Please don't raise your hand, right? It's not easy, is it? It's not easy to be married. It's hard. It takes work. And Paul says, I want to spare you from that difficulty. I want to free you up to serve the Lord without any restraint. Again, is he saying that marriage is bad? No. He wants godly men and women to be free to serve the Lord 
without any restraint or difficulty, and that is his heart. So we need to wait on the Lord. God has a calling for you. You need to observe his word. You need to observe the culture. You need to be content. Trust that God's plan and purpose are best, and he will lead and guide in his will and timing. And so if you're hearing this and you're single, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Our lesson here is this. I can serve the Lord effectively only as I am content with his placement. Do read that with me, please. I can serve the Lord effectively only as I am content with his placement. God doesn't make mistakes. He put you here. He is calling you to serve him exactly as you are. Don't think that service for Christ demands a change in your relationship status. God has plans for you. He has called you. He has placed you. Serve him as you wait. So there's two actions. Be observant. Be content. We're talking about three responsibilities. We are to wait on the Lord. This has to do with our calling from God. Our second responsibility. To fulfill our mission, we work for the Lord. Work for the Lord. In my lifetime, I'd have the, I've had the privilege of doing a lot of different jobs. Okay? I've been a motel maid. I've worked construction. I've done flooring. I've washed dishes. I, there's ones I'm forgetting in there. When I was working construction, uh, I was trying to very quickly cut something so that we could fit it into place. And I wasn't paying close enough attention. And so I'm cutting away, and all of a sudden, it stops. You know, I push the, click the button a few times, nothing. And I turn around and only to realize I had cut the cord in half as I was cutting the board. Ever since that day, I've paid, paid very careful attention to where the cords are, uh, lesson learned. God has a mission for us. But he wants us to pay attention to the mission that he's given if we are not careful, we can end up causing damage or failing to get the work done at all. With that in mind, we have two goals as we work for the Lord. Goal number one, be focused. Be focused. As we think about what Paul has said so far, a question comes to mind. What is Paul's motivation for the advice that he is giving? Paul answers that. Look at the beginning of verse 29. He says this, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. Why is Paul saying, look, guys, because of the present distress, don't, don't get married. Don't get divorced. Just stay how God has you because the time is short. What is he trying to communicate? We have a job to do. And it's like you have a job to do and the deadline is getting closer. And he's saying, guys, the time is short. There needs to be a sense of urgency to accomplish the mission that God has given. Christ is going to return. Be focused on your mission. He then explains how our focus on the mission and call of Christ impacts our various relationships. Look at the end of verse 29 says, the time is short so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. This is how focused we are to be. Now, what is Paul saying? He already said, don't get divorced. So are we supposed to ignore our spouse? Is that what Paul is teaching? No. What he's teaching is we cannot use family as an excuse for not serving. Well, Lord, I would serve you, but, you know, I, I can't. All of us can serve. Now, our service is going to look different depending on what stage of life we are in. Does that make sense? Someone who is working a 40 or 50 or whatever hour work week, their service is going to look different than someone who's retired. Someone who's raising children, their service is going to look different than someone whose children are grown and gone. But all of us are to be serving. We cannot use it as an excuse to do nothing. That is Paul's point. To serve Christ, we forgo pleasure, but not responsibility. Now look at verse 30. Verse 30, those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Mourning and loss can be used as an excuse not to serve. Now, 
I am not saying that you don't mourn, and I'm not saying that you need to ignore loss. What I'm saying is take time to mourn, grieve, recover, and get back into the game, right? Start serving. Start doing. Don't be one, and then he says, uh, those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Don't live for pleasure. Don't chase a good time. Joy and sorrow in this life are temporary. We serve Christ because at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. We're going to be called to something better when he returns. Now look at the end of verse 30. He says, those who buy as though they did not possess. What he's saying is wealth amassed simply to get rich or to live an extravagant life is not the will of God. What did Jesus say? Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupt and thieves do not break in or steal. And then the very important verse, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Okay? So Paul's saying the same thing. <laughs> He's saying, look, don't live for the temporary riches of this life. Okay? Our treasure is in heaven. We have a God who promises to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Don't allow the pursuit of wealth to hinder your service. Now look at verse 31. And those who use this world as not misusing it. We have to live in the world. However, we must not love the world. We have to live and work and make a living. We have to function in a society around us, but we dare not lose sight of the mission. What is the mission? The gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Finally, Paul states the idea that the time is short. He restates it in the end of verse 31. He says, For the form of this world is passing away. This world will not last. This is a theme we see over and over in Scripture. How ridiculous it is to lay up treasures that aren't going to last. How ridiculous is it to build bigger and better and more and nicer to put money in a bank when one day they're going to burn up? Now, does that mean we need to all be, uh, you know, dress in rags and, and uh, eat slop? No. This is between us and the Lord, how we live and to what level we live our lives, right? And what we do with our money. But Paul's just saying, if all we're doing is amassing more and more and more, it's not okay. So the lesson in these verses is that service with a mission means I spend my life on things of eternal significance. Would you read that with me, please? Service with a mission means I spend my life on things of eternal significance. Paul says, the form of this world is passing away. Therefore, we focus on serving the Lord where he has placed us. We have been called by God. We have been placed by God. We have been given a mission by God. And our mission is bigger than any excuse. That's what Paul's saying. Paul's message to all of us, single or not, is this. Don't be distracted. Don't make excuses. Serve God. Serve God. Our first goal as we work for the Lord in our mission is to be focused. We are to be focused. We're working for the Lord and we're focused. Goal number two, be committed. Be committed. When someone is doing a job for us, we want them to stick with it until it is done. Does that make sense? You don't want to hire someone to renovate your bathroom and have them rip everything out and then be like, see ya. Right? We want them to be committed to the job that they are doing. God wants the same. Paul gives us his heart in the end of verse 35. The end of verse 35, he says this. And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. That's his heart. 
That's why he's writing this. I want you to serve the Lord without distraction. And there's three areas of commitment here, and we're going to run through these pretty quickly. First, we need to be committed to the Lord. That's what he presents in verses 32 and in verse 34. Be committed to the Lord. Verse 32, But I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. Paul's basically saying, I want to unburden you. I want to give you freedom to serve. We have a single focus, and that is to please the Lord. Now, it's not that a married person can't serve the Lord. It's that there are cares and concerns that naturally make it more difficult to do that with the same freedom that a single person would enjoy. And the beginning of verse 34 reinforces what Paul says here. He says in verse 34, there's a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. So this is her commitment. She's fully committed to the Lord. She says she's holy. She has set apart for his service in body and spirit to please him. We are to care about the things of the Lord. We are to please him. Is that what we are living for? Do we live to bring God pleasure? There's a second area of commitment, and that is to be committed to your spouse. So we need to be committed to the Lord, but we also need to be committed to our spouse for those who are married. Look at verse 33. He says, But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. This is not presented as a negative. We need to understand that. Paul's not saying, poor guy, he's got to take care of his wife, or poor gal, she's got to take care of her husband. That's not his point. His point is that as married people, we have a responsibility to care for each other. That is a biblical, Christ-honoring responsibility. But that is a responsibility that single people don't have. Okay? And so he's saying, look, Because of the present distress, because of everything that's going on, in his opinion, it's better to stay how you are because marriage is hard. And he wants you to be free to serve Christ. Okay? He's not letting us married people off the hook. Oh, yay, we don't have to serve Christ. He already covered that. (laughs) Okay? Peter tells us we're to dwell with our wives with understanding. We're to please our spouse. The end of verse 34, But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Now, this isn't just talking when we're pleasing each other. It's not just sexual pleasure. We are to live with one another and make each other's lives better. We are to fulfill one another emotionally. We are to help one another grow in our walk with Christ. For those who are married, our work for the Lord involves being committed to our spouse. So Paul, he's writing and he says, look, Corinthian church, you need to be committed. You need to be committed to the Lord. If you're married, you need to be committed to your spouse. Finally, we are to be committed to spiritual service. Look at verse 35. Verse 35, And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. Paul says this for our profit. The idea of this word is that it will aid us in the achievement of a particular end. Okay? So Paul's not trying to say people shouldn't get married. He's saying, consider the time in which we live and make sure God is calling you into marriage. And if God has called you into marriage, don't get distracted. (laughs) A single person doesn't have this concern. And so Paul's desire is that we serve the Lord without distraction. The will of God for us in whatever condition we are, whether you're married or whether you're single, the will of God is to serve him, to serve Christ. And so the lesson is this, I must serve with commitment until the mission is accomplished. Would you read that with me, please? I must serve with commitment until the mission is accomplished. When is the mission accomplished? When Christ returns. When God calls you home, right? What are we just saying? It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. This means that as long as I am drawing breath, I have a job to do. Just coming to church is not your job, okay? You have service to do. And it's not just service in the church. Each one of us as believers is called by God to evangelize, to share the gospel with others. We're called to serve. As we work for the Lord, we have two goals. We're focused and we are committed. There are three 
responsibilities. Wait on the Lord. This has to do with our calling from God. Work for the Lord. This has to do with our mission from God. Thirdly, walk with the Lord. This has to do with our fellowship. Often in Scripture, the believer's relationship with the Lord is illustrated by a walk. Walking with the Lord indicates this. When you are walking with someone, it is because you're going the same direction, you have the same purpose, and you are headed towards the same goal. Scripture says two cannot walk together except they be agreed. You have to agree, right? We are to walk with the Lord, which means we're in agreement with Him. And this ability comes with two requirements. Requirement number one, we have to be spirit-led. Be spirit-led. Now, verses 36 to 38 are a difficult section of Scripture because there's a lot of uh, ideas about how to translate it, and there's a lot of ideas about how to interpret it. Okay? So what you're going to get today is what I think. Uh, others may disagree with me, and that is okay. The end result is going to be the same, okay? but how we get there might be a little different. So Paul has already addressed single people, married people, divorced people, widowed people, married, people married to unbelievers, and now he's going to address, address those who are engaged to be married. This is a difficult section. The New King does a pretty good job, but it's still a little bit confusing. Uh, in my preparation, I read about seven or eight different translations, right? And I don't do that because I'm, uh, I'm uncertain which one I like better. I do that because it helps me think through it, right? And as I studied the Greek text and as I looked at the translations, it occurred to me that the ESV probably has the clearest translation here, and that's the English Standard Version. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read that in, from verses 36 to 38, um, and you'll see what I mean. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly towards his betrothed, if his passions are strong, and it has to be, let him do as he wishes, let them marry, it is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart to keep his, her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then, he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. So this is what I believe to be what the text is trying to communicate. It's not talking about a father trying to give his daughter away. It's talking about people who are engaged. Why do I think that? Because of the Greek text, because of the context, because that's what they're talking about, um, and because there's actually some words in here where he says, let them marry, meaning the two people he's talking about. Okay, so it best fits everything going on in the text. Okay. In this culture, Paul says, um, uh, if he's behaving improperly, if, it gets, if someone's engaged and he's feeling like, I don't know if the Lord wants us to get married or not, and he says it gets to the point where in that culture, people were going, okay, buddy, engagement is really important. What are you doing here? If it gets to the point where it's improper, right, where it is dishonorable, he says, marry. It's not sinful, Right? It says, if it's getting to the point where your behavior towards your fiancé is dishonorable, marry. Or, he says, if she's past the flower of youth. This is a very delicate translation of an interesting Greek word. Because basically, the Greek idea is uh, someone who's at their sexual peak. That's what it's talking about. Okay? So, that's why ESV has, if their passions are strong, right? If his passions are strong. What he's saying is there's normal, healthy, um, fully developed, mature adults. God has designed us in such a way that we have sexual passions. That's the way God made us. Okay? These are normal and good. Paul's saying if two young people are engaged and they're very attracted to each other, get married. It's not sinful to do that. And I want to point that out. He says marriage is not sinful. Paul makes that very clear. Paul's issue is he wants you to be unencumbered in your service. So he, and then second, he says, uh, let them do what he wishes. This is really interesting. Because sometimes we get the idea that my desires and my wants don't really matter. But Paul says, let them do what they want. Let them do what they desire. Okay? Now, I don't mean, there's, there's a verse in, in Psalms that's misused. Right? It's Psalms 37, verse 4, and it says this, uh, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will 
give you the desires of your heart. And some people say, well, see, if I delight in the Lord, he's going to give me whatever I want. That's not what the verse is saying. What the verse is saying is, when we delight in the Lord, he changes our desires to be in line with his will. So what Paul is saying is this young couple, they desire to be married. That means that they're desiring something that God has given them that desire. Okay? It's a good thing. That's why he says it's not sinful. He's being led by the Holy Spirit into marriage. And what Paul acknowledges in verse 37 is that others will be led by the Holy Spirit to never get married. The key is in being spirit-led. Paul says this person is steadfast in heart. It means he's resolved to a particular course of action. He has no necessity. It means they're not in distress over marriage. They're able to be unmarried and honor Christ in their singleness. He says he has power over his own will. This word power means authority. He has the ability to choose whatever he wants. This isn't a sin issue. It has to do with our calling from God. And then he says he has determined in his heart. He has a fixed purpose. His service for Christ will be in singleness. The only way to be determined and steadfast in heart is when we are led by the Holy Spirit. And so if God has called you to singleness, he will give the strength and determination to live in it. And I want you to hear this. It doesn't mean that singleness is a permanent call. God may change that. Verse 38 has to be understood in its context. Paul is not saying that marriage is bad. He's giving his opinion in light of the present distress. So what do we take from this? We need to seek the Lord's direction. And when we have peace about a decision, we act. So, here's the lesson. Action is to be taken only as the Spirit leads. Would you read that with me, please? Action is to be taken only as the Spirit leads. When we walk with the Lord, He's going to lead us. He has two requirements. We need to be spirit-led. Secondly, we need to be Christ-centered. Christ-centered. Paul ends this section of the book by expounding how serious the commitment of marriage is. Right? So he's, he begins in the beginning of chapter 7, and he walks them through all these different scenarios and all these different things, and he ends with this reminder, marriage is serious. Marriage is serious. Look at verse 39. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. Marriage is permanent. When you are called by God and choose to get married, it is a lifelong commitment. Therefore, choose carefully and choose wisely. And that's where Paul goes next. The end of verse 39. He says, uh, But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Death ends a marriage covenant. And someone who finds themselves in that situation is free to be married. Uh, there's two things here. First, he says you can marry whoever you want, except it needs to be a believer. That's the second thing. Okay? Now, this blows up a popular notion that God has one person for you. You just got to find that one person. And if you miss him, yeah, well, that stinks, huh? No, that's not what he's saying. He says you can marry whoever you want, as long as they're a believer. Now, I think there needs to be some wisdom and discernment exercised in doing that, but they need to be a believer. That is his stipulation. But once you are married, it is for life. A Christ-centered person chooses a spouse who will enhance their ability to serve. We are to be Christ-centered in our marriages. Look at verse 40. But she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment. And I think also I have the Spirit of God. Where does Paul end? He ends where he began. He says, I think it's better to stay single. But the point is, whether married or single, we're to be Christ-centered. Again, the word judgment could be translated opinion. We have to remember that Paul is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he has been very clear. Our ability to serve Christ with single-minded devotion and purpose is best served by singleness. That has been his argument. However, he does not say that marriage is bad or wrong. Because God uses godly marriages to produce godly children, to raise up a godly generation, and to counsel and mentor other people. The key in either instance is if it enhances your ability to serve. 
The lesson here is that a Christ-centered believer acts only at his direction. Do you read that with me, please? A Christ-centered believer acts only at his direction. Is this true of us? Are we acting on the direction of Christ? How are we directed? Through his word. This is how he directs us. So if we're not in this, we're not going to have direction. So these are our two requirements. If we're going to walk with the Lord, we must be spirit-led and Christ-centered. Though our title is how to be single, these responsibilities apply to us all. Wait on the Lord. He has a calling for each and every one of us. Don't get ahead of his leading. We need biblical discernment. We need contentment. Wait on the Lord. Work for the Lord. You and I have a mission. Our mission is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we cannot do the work if we're distracted. We cannot work if we are always looking around for something better. Wait on the Lord. Work for the Lord. Walk with the Lord. Be led by the Spirit. This means we cannot have unconfessed sin in our lives. If we do, we will not hear the still small voice of God. Center your life around Christ. This means letting go of everything that hinders our service. I don't know what the Lord may have spoken to you about today. Whatever it is, I want you to take a minute to write it down. And then I want you to write down who you're going to share it with. I want you to ask them to check up on you and see how you have done in your commitment. So take just a moment and write down a commitment. Waiting on the Lord takes patience. Do you know what patience is? It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. That means that we can only wait on the Lord as we submit to the Holy Spirit. Working for the Lord requires perseverance. Perseverance is produced through a consistently disciplined life. So, to work for the Lord, we must be disciplined. Walking with the Lord requires a path. God reveals His path in His Word. And so our walk with Christ demands knowledge of his word. Married or single, our responsibility is the same. Live out your calling, fulfill your mission, and rest in the fellowship of Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so very much for your word. Thank you that your word is not comfortable, that your word does not... Allow us to have thinking that is incorrect, to have lives that are not in submission to your will. And I pray, Father, that if there are changes that we need to make today, that we would make them. I pray, Father, that we would not leave here with the thoughts in our hearts going, I wish that the message had been shorter. I wish the music had been different. I wish that this would have changed or that would have changed. I pray that we would leave here first and foremost in awe of our awesome God who writing this centuries ago, it is so relevant today. Your word speaks to us today. And I pray, Father, that we would leave here going, this is what I need to do. Thank you. May this week everything we do, everything we say, or everything we think, Bring praise and honor and glory to you in your name. We pray this all in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen.